<coughs> okay, we are going to uh, get started now officially. Uh, welcome to the 12th annual Free State Foundation Telecom Policy Conference. Uh, each year, when I say that, the, the number, which of course keeps increasing, I'm somewhat uh, amazed. I, I can remember very easily standing here in this room and saying welcome to the third annual conference and fourth annual conference and so forth. So uh, it still startles me a bit to say the 12th, uh, but we're especially pleased all of you are here and uh, we are also live streaming uh, this event today on our Facebook page. Uh, if you look for Free State Foundation on Facebook, we're live streaming and we uh, welcome all of those viewers from ar around the country, if not the world. Well, in planning this uh, annual conference in past years, we've had to deal with frogs, boils, hail, and locusts, uh, and you biblical scholars should recognize by now that I'm referring to the plagues in the Ten Com in, in Exodus. Uh, well, we really haven't had to deal with uh, hail, but we did have to deal with snow uh, one year. Uh, and uh, one of the, those ten plagues, you'll recall, is pestilence. And I guess the coronavirus probably fits within the uh, pestilence definition, uh, at least in the biblical sense. Of course, I don't want to make light of the coronavirus, uh, and, and I'm not. Uh, rather, I'm just going to say here at the outset, of course, that, that our thoughts are with all of those who may have been affected by it, may be affected by it, and, uh, and we hope, uh, I know everyone here hopes that uh, it uh, can speedily uh, be brought under control uh, and that things will get back to normal. Uh, there, there are just a couple changes in today's program, not many, resulting from the uh, uh, the coronavirus and the way it affects uh, different individuals, but we'll get to those later. Um, but for everyone here today, and I've been getting in this mode myself, elbow bumps are uh, perfectly acceptable. Uh, or someone this morning taught me actually that there's a way you do something with your feet, I guess a footsie move that I, that I, was not familiar with, uh, but those are acceptable as well. Uh, now, I, I say this every year, uh, too, uh, so I'm going to do it again this year. Uh, I think that this conference will be just as outstanding as all of the, the previous ones. The conferences have been getting bigger and better and more impactful each year. And I'm sure that that will be the case this year, even, even with uh, in, in, in the midst of the um, uh, coronavirus impact. We always have an overarching theme for each conference, even though, as most of you know, some of the issues we address recur in one form or another over the years. Think net neutrality or universal service. This year's theme is broadband beyond 2020, competition, freedom, and privacy. Many of today's most important, even contentious public policy debates, from net neutrality to spectrum policy to privacy regulation to adapting to fast-changing media landscape, fit comfortably within that theme. No need now to address all of the other topics. What I'd rather do here is emphasize the beyond 2020 part of the theme. My hope is that much of our discussion, policy-wise, will be forward-looking in the spirit of 
How do we get from here to there to promote overall consumer welfare and further our national interest? We are pleased that Deputy Attorney General of the United States, Jeffrey Rosen, will deliver the opening keynote address, and I'll mm -hmm. introduce him in just a moment. He'll be followed by FTC Commissioner Christine Wilson's keynote. Then we'll have a panel discussion, and following that panel discussion, we'll hear uh, from Special Assistant to the President for Technology and Telecom and Cybersecurity Policy, Robin Colwell. That's a, a, a lot packed into that title, isn't there? Uh, and then we're going to break for lunch. Uh, during the lunch session, we're, uh, we're going to uh, uh, have a video from Chairman Pai. Uh, he told me yesterday he wasn't able uh, to be with us today, but he did record a video, which we're going to be showing. And then we're going to have the conversation uh, after that with uh, the commissioners. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, before I introduce uh, Deputy Attorney General Rosen, I want to say, and again, I repeat this often, proudly, but at the Free State Foundation, we proclaim our commitment to free state, to excuse me, to free market oriented policies, along with respect for property rights and the rule of law. But we know that not everyone shares our philosophical disposition. And even among those who do, there are often good faith differences regarding practical application of these principles in particular cases. Our goal at the conference is to educate, stimulate discussion, and through civil discourse, perhaps even move a few steps closer to reaching consensus. I'm grateful to all of you that are here for your interest and participation in the Free State Foundations programs and activities, and for your friendship. Please don't ever doubt that. Uh, finally, I want to give you our Twitter handle. I think it's on our program brochure and all around, but uh, I hope you'll tweet today, and the hashtag is uh, FSFCONF12. Hashtag FSFCONF12. So tweet away. Now, with that done, I'm pleased to introduce our opening keynote speaker, the Honorable Jeffrey Rosen. Uh, Mr. Rosen is the 38th Deputy Attorney General of the United States. <laughs> President Trump announced his intention to nominate Mr. Rosen to this position in February 2019, and the Senate confirmed the nomination in May 2019. That's lightning speed uh, these days for, for confirmations. Though most of his career was spent in the private sector as a partner with the law firm of Kirkland and Ellis, Mr. Rosen has been appointed to several senior public service positions and twice previously confirmed by the U.S. Senate. Most recently, he was Deputy Secretary of Transportation and he also served as general counsel and senior policy advisor for the White House Office of Management and Budget and as general counsel of the Department of Transportation. Now, Mr. Rosen has also served as an appointed public member of the Administrative Conference of the United States and chair of the American Bar Association Section of Administrative Law and Regulatory Practice. At least with regard to those two positions, Jeff has followed in my footsteps since I preceded him in those two offices. Be that as it may, Jeff has, is now Deputy Attorney General of the United States, and I'm merely the president of the Free State Foundation. <laughs> I'm proud not only to have worked with Jeff over the many years in administrative law and regulatory fields, but also to call him a friend. And you've noticed I have slipped into uh, uh, the usage of, of Jeff, and uh, I hope he doesn't mind, but we've been friends for probably 25, 25 years or so. I've known and respected a great many fine public servants 
but I have no hesitancy in saying that Deputy Attorney General Rosen is one of the very finest that I've ever met. So now join me in welcoming Jeffrey Rosen, please. Well, good morning to everybody, and thank you, Randy, for that very kind introduction. I'm very pleased to be a part of the Free State Foundation's 12th Annual Telecom Policy Conference. At the Department of Justice, we've been carefully considering many of the same issues that are on today's program agenda. As many of you know, last summer we announced a review of market-leading online platforms as a department priority. Antitrust and competition policy are a core focus of our review. But the issues presented by the market-leading online platforms reach more broadly. This is why we are also assessing areas like user privacy, data protection, and public safety as they relate to online platforms. We are also looking at Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, a topic which I will discuss later in my remarks. So I want to start today by talking a little bit about innovation and antitrust. One of the several reasons that we are focused on market-leading platforms is that innovation is such an important aspect of our economy and therefore of our future. Innovation has long been a focus of antitrust law, both in the merger review context and when assessing potentially anti-competitive conduct. As an example, the, de the department's horizontal merger guidelines provide a framework for analyzing when a merger or acquisition is, quote, likely to diminish innovation competition by encouraging the merged firm to curtail its innovative efforts below the level that would prevail absent the merger, close quote. Those guidelines counsel us to consider not only reduced incentives to innovate in existing products, but also new lines of business. Although the antitrust goal of protecting innovation is nothing new, it has gained more attention recently. Despite the wonders produced by the World Wide Web, some say that innovation in the United States has actually been on a decline in the last two decades. Some even say that the tech giants that produce some of those wonders are in part to blame. Across the spectrum, there are calls for government to act quickly and boldly to help ensure there is room for another wave of innovation that can improve people's lives. And in particular, there are some economists who are concerned that innovation is waning. Among those is Professor Robert Gordon at Northwestern, who in 2016 published a much discussed book that was called The Rise and Fall of American Growth, the U.S. Standard of Living Since the Civil War. So I thought it would be useful to consider some of the questions and concerns that he raised in that book. Gordon painted a grim picture of economic growth and innovation since 1970, finding that they had declined significantly through the year 2014. In stark contrast, Gordon found that the 100 years between 1870 and 1970 was what he called a special century where unprecedented economic growth was driven by transformative innovations. Think electricity, cars, airplanes, washers, radios, televisions, movies, all of which came about in something like their modern form during this period. Now, especially uh, germane to this group, obviously one of the most disruptive innovations of the special century was the development of the telephone in the United States around the turn of the 20th century. Alexander Graham Bell's 1876 patent application for a speaking telephone was arguably the most valuable patent ever filed. A transformation in human connectedness quickly followed this great innovation. But so did the Bell system monopoly in the years after that. As a dominant firm with vast resources and the technological expertise of Bell Labs, the old AT&T Bell system made a number of important innovations in the telecommunications realm and beyond. But with its dominance cemented, the old Bell system 
sometimes showed itself resistant to change in part due to monopolistic incentives and protective regulation, and there were claims that innovation was less than it might have been. The government's antitrust case against AT&T was filed in 1974, and it's been suggested that the competition and ensuing innovation that followed would not have flourished in the way it did without the resulting divestiture of AT&T's local exchanges from its long distance network and the manufacturing businesses around 1984. That's significant because, Professor Gordon says, the telecommunications proved to be an exception to the productivity slowdown that occurred around 1970. He is among those who say that the breakup of the AT&T monopoly helped set the stage for a third industrial revolution of innovation in communications that was followed by the entry of new players into telephony and broadband and the dramatic developments in mobile wireless with widespread use of smartphones. So if Professor Gordon is right, antitrust policy rightly deserves a degree of credit. Professor Gordon's book also credits today's tech platform giants, for example, Amazon, Google, Facebook as, as illustrations, for their part in this, what he calls, third industrial revolution. But he also poses a provocative question, potentially relevant to our antitrust review. Is this third industrial revolution over? And if so, why? Gordon suggests that, quote, the revolutions in everyday life made possible by e-commerce and search engines were well established by 2004, close quote. For the decade after that, Gordon claims innovation and growth were far more disappointing. Gordon also reminds us that today's tech giants that helped drive this revolution are really no longer that new. Amazon dates back to 1994 and Google in 1998. Even Facebook is now 16 years old. So this might lead us to ask, where's the next big innovation? And why are we not seeing the same type of fundamental technological change today? One of the questions that's inevitably presented in, in this kind of review is whether innovation dec has declined, as some argue, because of monopoly positions held by some of today's uh, very large platforms. As the Seventh Circuit wrote in a monopolization case only two weeks ago, quote, the harms that typically flow from a competitive market shifting to total control by a monopolist include reduced innovation, close quote. Or, as the economist Kenneth Arrow once put it, an incumbent's incentive to innovate is lessened because the resulting innovation replaces existing profitable sales. According to that theory, innovations are more likely to come not from a monopolist, but from an outsider without existing sales to replace. By contrast, an incumbent monopolist has every incentive to thwart innovative outsiders. And some suggest that's what we've seen today. There are numerous articles written about the tech giant's so-called kill zones. That is the strategy of buying upstart challenges to remove them as a competitive threat. Others claim that there's no incentive to innovate when a dominant company can simply replicate any new idea itself and with existing network effects reap the commercial reward. Still others claim that sharp business practices by entrenched firms have prevented innovators from gaining tractions. So the Department of Justice's review of online platforms is ongoing, so I'm not yet able today to answer any of the questions I just posed. But we do have some answers regarding another recent antitrust matter that, at least in part, concerned innovation. Just last month, a district court in the Southern District of New York rejected the effort by a minority of state attorney generals to try to block the proposed merger of Sprint and T-Mobile, notwithstanding the actions taken by the federal antitrust and telecommunications agencies to address competitive concerns. Regarding the topic of innovation, Judge Marrero, in that decision, said that AT&T and Verizon, the longtime market share leaders in mobile wireless services, had typically not been innovators in consumer services, despite having high-quality networks. 
Instead, he said they had largely responded to the innovations of others in the market. Now, if the Tunney Act proceeding also enables uh, this merger, T-Mobile and Sprint could have the opportunity together to become a stronger competitor and help push forward the more rapid introduction of 5G technology, which is expected to be a cornerstone of future innovation across many economic sectors. Let me, let me pause just to say, in thinking more broadly about innovation in antitrust, it can be helpful to look back at some of the technology companies that dominated past eras. For example, IBM dominated the computer hardware era. Microsoft dominated the software era. And as with the evolution of the Bell system and the telecommunications sector that I talked about a few minutes ago, antitrust played a role in all of these transitions. The Department of Justice brought antitrust enforcement actions against IBM in 1969 and Microsoft in 1998. One lawsuit was eventually dismissed and one ultimately prevailed. Both of those enforcement actions coincided with a one technology era ending and a new one beginning. So I just want to say that the antitrust division and all of us at DOJ who are responsible for antitrust enforcement are very much aware of this history and we pay close attention to the role of antitrust with regard to technological innovation. Okay, so shifting gears just a little, as we focus on market-leading online platforms, there is another major issue that has come to the forefront, and that is Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act of 1996. Section 230 has played a role in both the good and the bad of the online world. It has no doubt contributed to new offerings and growth online. At the same time, as DOJ is the agency tasked with protecting the American public through enforcing the law, we are concerned that Section 230 has also enabled some harm. As background for anyone who is less familiar with Section 230, here is what one of its key provisions says, quote, no provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be treated as the publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information content provider, close quote. The typical example involves alleged defamation by a user of social media, for example. Under Section 230, the social media site is not liable for what the user says, although the user themselves may still be liable. Section 230 also immunizes websites from some liability for in good faith removing illicit user-generated comment that is, quote, obscene, lewd, lascivious, filthy, excessively violent, harassing, or otherwise objectionable, close quote. The name of that section says a lot, protection for good Samaritan blocking and screening of offensive material. So we have been carefully looking at the benefits and the costs of Section 230 as part of our broader review of the online platforms. We recently convened a conference with thought leaders from a wide variety of perspectives in academia, victims' rights groups, civil society, and technology experts, among others. With nearly 500 attendees and thousands more streaming online, we heard the benefits and the problems with Section 230. Additionally, the department held a private roundtable with thought leaders on all sides of the Section 230 debate to discuss problems and solutions in more detail. Numerous companies impacted by Section 230 also have provided us a greater understanding of how it impacts their everyday businesses and their commercial choices. There are, of course, some obvious benefits of Section 230. It has been dubbed the 26 words that created the internet and it's not hard to see why. When Section 230 was enacted in 1996, it enabled the growth of platforms that hosted user-generated content without fear that doing so would expose the platform to massive civil liability as publishers or speakers of that content. Without Section 230, some say, 
the potential civil liability and the cost of litigation could have forced companies to significantly curtail their user-generated content or even to cease to exist altogether. But there's a dark side, too. To say the least, the online world has changed a lot in the 25 years since the original drafting of Section 230. The Internet is no longer made up of the rudimentary bulletin boards and chat rooms of AOL, CompuServe, and Prodigy. But instead, it is now a vital and ever-present aspect of both our personal and professional modern lives. Indeed, it's now somewhat quaint to think of the likes of CompuServe hosting online comments. Instead, major online platforms now actively match us with news stories and friends, and whether by algorithm or otherwise, effectively choose much of what our children see and enable a seemingly limitless number of people to connect with us or with our children. And platforms are often themselves speakers and publishers of their own content and not mere forums for others to communicate. Now, a quarter of a century after its enactment, there is also recognition that Section 230 immunity has not always been a force for good, particularly in light of some of the extraordinarily broad interpretations given to it by some courts. For example, Platforms have been used to connect predators with children, to facilitate terrorist activity, and as a tool for extreme online harassment. The drafters of Section 230 might be surprised by that development. Remember, Section 230 was but one provision in the much larger Communications Decency Act of 1996. As its name suggests, the primary aim of the Communications Decency Act was to promote decency on the internet and create a safe environment for children online. As it turned out, the Supreme Court rejected most of the Communications Decency Act on First Amendment grounds. The most significant piece that survived was Section 230. But rather than furthering the purposes of its underlying bill, some scholars have argued that Section 230 has instead immunized platforms, quote, where they, number one, knew about users' illegal activity, ac illegal activity, deliberately refused to remove it, and ensured that those responsible could not be identified, two, solicited users to engage in tortious and illegal activity, and three, designed their sites to enhance the visibility of illegal activity and to ensure that the perpetrators could not be identified and caught, close quote. So it's to address concerns such as those and others that have been raised. Um, we see at least four areas that are potentially ripe for engagement. First, as a threshold matter, it would seem relatively uncontroversial that there should be no special statutory immunity for websites that purposefully enable illegality and harm to children. Nor does someone appear to be a good Samaritan if they set up their services in a way that makes it impossible for law enforcement to enforce criminal laws. In these particular situations, why shouldn't the website or platform have to defend and justify the reasonableness of their conduct on the merits, just like businesses operating outside of the virtual world? Second, the Department of Justice is also concerned about Section 230's impacts on our law enforcement function and the law enforcement efforts of our partners throughout the executive branch. In our discussions with scholars and members of the public on this topic, many have been surprised to learn that Section 230 is increasingly being claimed as a defense against the federal government in civil actions. Now, to be clear, Section 230 has a carve-out for certain federal criminal enforcement, but not all problems can be solved by federal criminal law. Federal civil actions play a very important role in their own right. The increasing invocation of Section 230 in the federal in, uh, civil enforcement context often goes beyond the purpose of the Communications Decency Act and can undermine the goals of Section 230 itself. Third, we are concerned about expansions of Section 230 into areas that have little connection 
to the statute's original purpose. As I mentioned earlier, the core of Section 230 concerns defamation and other speech-related torts. And for good reason, the restaurant review platform, for example, has no idea whether the user is right when he says the soup was cold or when she says the service was poor, nor does the social media site have any idea whether a nosy neighbor's online comments about the new person down the block are true or not. Civil immunity from tort litigation for online platforms in these instances makes some sense. The alternative would be a quasi-heckler's veto where the restaurant or the neighbor could complain about the comments and the platform would be forced to take them down for fear of civil liability. But some websites have tried to transform Section 230 into an all-purpose immunity for claims that are far removed from speech. For example, uh, some platforms have argued that Section 230 permits them to circumvent or ignore city ordinances on the licensing of rental properties. While these types of arguments have not always succeeded, they demonstrate the potentially overbroad scope that some advocates have given to the immunity. Fourth, we are concerned about the extent to which platforms have expanded the use of Section 230 to immunize taking down content beyond the types listed in the statute. Under the Good Samaritan provision, as I said, platforms have the ability to remove content that they have a good faith belief is obscene, lewd, lascivious, filthy, excessively violent, harassing, or otherwise objectionable. We are told that some platforms treat this provision as a blank check, ignoring the good faith requirement and relying on the broad term otherwise objectionable as carte blanche to selectively remove anything from websites for other reasons and still claim an immunity. So perhaps there needs to be a more clear definition of both good faith and for the vague term otherwise objectionable should be reconsidered. Of course, platforms can choose whether or not to remove any content on their websites, but should they automatically be granted full statutory immunity for removing lawful speech and given carte blanche as a censor if the content is not obscene, lewd, lascivious, filthy, excessively violent, or harassing under the statute? After 25 years, it seems that the time has come for Congress to assess what changes to Section 30 are now needed and whether there are ways to realign some of its incentives in a better way. The Justice Department continues to welcome further input on this important topic as we prepare to address proposed changes. When all is said and done, we'd like to see the benefits maintained and enhanced while the harms are mitigated. So, Having had my say today, let me thank you again for the opportunity to share these thoughts. I appreciate the Free State Foundation's role in enhancing the public discourse on important issues like these, and I look forward to a continued public dialogue. Thanks very much for having me. Jeff, uh, thanks very much for those uh, important remarks. We appreciate it. So what we're going to do now, if you have your program, you'll see we uh, have scheduled uh, comments, reactions, by uh, FTC General Counsel Alden Abbott and Tom Johnson from the FCC. Unfortunately, I <coughs> found out uh, late yesterday that uh, General Counsel Johnson is not able to be with us today, so uh, we're going to hear from uh, Alden Abbott, and then I think uh, I may reserve a, a, just a little bit of that uh, time that's left to play Tom Johnson if I have anything to add. So I'm going to call on Alden, and Alden, you're welcome to speak from uh, this seat, or you can stand, whatever you prefer. Uh, the, the seat is fine. Uh and just Randy, how, take how a, much time? Why don't we say uh, take about six or seven minutes? S six or seven minutes. Six, six or seven. You okay, guys, excellent. You guys can help 
me with the time out in the audience. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much, Randy, and thank you for the Free State Foundation for inviting me to this great event. Uh, we, the views I express today are my own and not necessarily those of the Federal Trade Commission or any Federal Trade Commissioner. Now, I want to uh, uh, applaud and then second, you know, certainly the spirit of Deputy Attorney General Rosen's remark. Clearly, uh, as he acknowledged, uh, antitrust enforcement has played a very important part in uh, examining new technology issues. And there is a tension, obviously, between uh, defending competition, and which is the goal of the Federal Trade Commission, as well as the antitrust division, and allowing new innovation to flourish, and what is the role of competition law in dealing with innovation. And uh, commendably, the Justice Department is very involved in looking at that, uh, as is the Federal Trade Commission. For those of you who don't know, the Federal Trade Commission uh, enforces, as a Justice Department, the Clayton Antitrust Act, in particular Section 7, the merger provision of the Clayton Act. Uh, it also has a statutory provision, Section 5 of the FTC Act, which uh, uh, forbids, uh, allow, allows the Commission to take action against unfair methods of competition. The courts have held that that certainly encompasses at least a full range of violations of the Sherman Antitrust Act. Of course, the Justice Department criminally enforces the Sherman Act. We do not. Uh, but our Section 5 authority also covers unfair or deceptive uh, acts or practices in or affecting interstate commerce. And that has been very important. And certainly, I'll mention 230 briefly, but that uh, we have an encountered Section 230 defenses in that regard. Now, with regard to what we're doing in, in antitrust, uh, the FTC has a long history of holding hearings, of public fora, and, and general informational investigations and reports apart and in, and in addition to its in, uh, enforcement activities. For example, in 2018 and 19, the Commission held a series of hearings on competition and consumer protection topics intended to help refresh a bipartisan consensus on a proper scope and direction of antitrust enforcement and policy. Uh, dubbed Hearings on Competition and Consumer Protection 21st Century. Uh, several panels discussed issues related to technology platforms and the digital economy, including the acquisition of potential or nascent competitors in a digital marketplace. And my uh, FTC colleagues in the Office of Policy Planning are carefully analyzing the papers and transcripts from that event, and certainly more will be said later about that. Uh, with regard to uh, other activities, uh, the FTC's uh, Bureau of Competition, which is in, enforces our uh, uh, part of antitrust enforcement, uh, established a technology enforcement division last year uh, to marshal resources and expertise from across the commission. The division is actively conducting investigations into markets in which digital technology is an important element of competition uh, including, of course, mergers and potentially um, anti-competitive conduct in digital technology space, including in particular digital platforms. Now, the Bureau of Competition has publicly confirmed the existence of an antitrust investigation regarding Facebook, although I'm not going to comment further on that investigation or any other non-public investigation uh, we may into any specific company which we may be conducting. Let me. Just mention, however, to sort to give you a sense, a flavor for the analysis we're looking at in considering uh, uh, digital platforms. We're asking, among other things, dominant, dominant platforms that have programs or policies uh, to systematically target nascent or potential rivals for acquisition or exclusion, including complementary partners today who might grow into competitors tomorrow. Is that a problem? Are dominant platforms deploying restraints with inter-platform effects to soften or eliminate competition? Are they using exclusivity com commitments, exclusive contracts, to deter entry or expansion without a sufficient inju efficiency justification? Are they uh, seeking to inefficiently punish or penalize trading partners for multi-honing with their competitors? Uh, are they targeting actual potential rivals for termination or restriction 
of some critical supply or interoperability without an efficiency justification. So this just, just gives you a flavor. Now, uh, I should mention on February 11th, uh, just a few weeks ago, the FTC issued special orders to five large technology firms requiring them to provide information about prior acquisitions not reported to the antitrust agencies under the Hart Scott Rodino Pre-Merger Notification Act. An acquisition is, that is reportable under the act cannot be finalized until a time period for federal antitrust review and possible challenges passed. HSR non-reportable acquisitions, which typically evade a, advanced antitrust review, involve mergers and joint ventures that fall under certain asset size and transaction value thresholds. The FTC special orders for an involving compulsory process require Alphabet Inc., which includes Google, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Microsoft to provide information and documents on terms, scope, structure, and purpose of transactions that each company consummated between uh, each uh, company consummated between January 1, 2010 and December 31, 2019. Um, and we issued the orders under sec Section 6B of our FTC Act, which authorizes the Commission to conduct wide-ranging studies that do not have a specific law enforcement purpose. Now, we have testified publicly we, about some investigations and enforcement actions we have involved, uh, we have undertaken, which involve platform issues. Uh, I do not have time to discuss some of them. Uh, again, if you go to our website, you can find testimony before congressional committees and speeches dealing with uh, high tech and platform enforcements. Finally, Section 230, Deputy Attorney General Rosen mentioned that it, Section 230 is sometimes asserted as a defense, and indeed that, that has happened a number of times to the Federal Trade Commission. I would just cite by example one case uh, which we succeeded uh, in, in the Second Circuit four years ago, uh, FTC v. Lead Click Media. What did that involve? Uh, basically, it involved uh, an, an action by the FTC, uh, injunctive action against a, a company for its role in the use of deceptive websites to market weight loss products. Lead Click managed a network of affiliates known as publishers to advertise on internet products uh, of its merchant clients uh, and uh, promoted websites falsely claiming that independent testing confirmed the efficacy of the products. Now, uh, let the firm, let click firm claimed, oh, we're uh, covered by Section 230, uh, and the FTC uh, and the, said, no, argued, no, you're not, and the court agreed, uh, and uh, specifically, uh, let me mention here, uh, the court stated, uh, despite the fact that claims, well, we're providing in, we're providing in some sort of internet service provision uh, by promoting these websites, they say, no, no, you're not getting the point. The key point is you are accountable for your own deceptive acts or practices. You've been directly involved in promoting those, and therefore you fall outside of 230. Uh, so however, the FTC succeeded. However, it does raise the point, raised by, uh, Deputy Attorney uh, General uh, Rosen, that we do need to cons be concerned about the frequent use of uh, Section 230 that might interfere with or undermine legitimate law enforcement investigations not involving the criminal law. And uh, I, I will stop right now. And, and thank you again for this opportunity, Randy. Alden, thank you very much for uh, being here. I, I mentioned earlier when I was introducing uh, the Deputy Attorney General that I have known him for uh, about 20, 25 years or so. And the same thing is true for uh, Alden Abbott. So it's, uh, you know, it's an honor for me uh, to have two, two old friends with me in the sense of old having known them for a long time. <laughs> uh, make, make that clear. Uh, okay, I said I would uh, uh, take Tom Johnson's uh, role here and just offer a couple comments. and. Uh, with the Deputy Attorney General's permission, just maybe uh, ask a couple of questions. One thing that caught my attention uh, when uh, Jeff was speaking is he referred to CompuServe at one point, and I had the uh, pleasure for a long time when I was in private practice of representing CompuServe in uh, 
you know, close to Genesis, uh, really, in this uh, new era, internet era, uh, really from about 1981 to 1986. And uh, so, yeah, it, you know, I'm familiar with the uh, time in which Section 230 uh, was debated and then enacted, and as uh, the Deputy Attorney General pointed out, that was 25 years ago, so I'm I'm familiar with those changes, and you know, I, I will say uh, to Jeff and everyone here, uh, you know, unlike some uh, some people, I, I certainly uh, I certainly appreciate the rationale for it at, at the time, and and it's continuing rationale in in many respects. But but having witnessed all, the, all of these changes, I you know, I don't. I'm not apoplectic, if that's the correct word, about a, a reexamination of it in the current time context. So let me just ask, pose maybe these two questions. Uh, and, and I'll just do them both, and then you could respond. You uh, said, I think, when you were outlining the four areas that were going to be examined, uh, something very close to uh, looking at whether uh, there should not be immunity for purposeful uh, conduct or purpose, purposefully, uh, uh, well, I think purposeful was the word you use, conduct uh, by the uh, platform providers that would uh, violate uh, the terms of the, the statute. And I, so one question that I had in listening to that was, I mean, I understand, you know, in the English language in one sense what purposeful means, but we have concepts in the law relating to, you know, intentionality and with different types of standards and, and degrees of, of understanding and intention. And I thought possibly you might have some further thoughts on on how you're thinking about that or others in the department. And then the second question is just, and if you address this, my apologies, but what, is there a timetable for uh, the department to uh, come out with a uh, report? And it, it, do you know whether when you do come out with something that's gonna be actual proposed leg legislation or or uh, just a report that's something short of proposed legislation, anything you're able to say at this early date about that, uh, I'm sure we would be interested. Um, <clears throat> take, taking the first question first, um, I use the word purposefully enable illegality, and I, the, the reason I said purposefully was to stay away from at this juncture the legal terms of arts as to intentional or reckless or you know various things, because I I didn't want to uh, say prematurely rule in or out what kind of mindset. But the the underlying concept of purposefully was something like, you know, there's there's now a, a carve out uh, for sites that are, are purposefully um, promote. Uh, sex trafficking and abuse, you know, abuse of children. And so the concept was somewhat like that, that um, there, there are websites, especially on the dark web, but not exclusively there, that in, uh, are specifically promoting illegal and, and harmful behavior. So purposefully, I, I don't think today I could refine it more. I chose that, as I say, to capture the, the concepts of of things being on purpose without getting into the legal term of terms of art. It sounds like you chose purposefully, purposefully. That's right. Uh, <laughs> That's at right. this point in time. That's right. Okay. What about the and, second question? And then the second question, um, I don't know if I can give a lot of specificity on that. I think we're 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 trying to refine our thinking expeditiously, and uh, would hope to make some. Uh, uh, specific suggestions, the form of that and the timing. I don't. I don't know that uh, I would want to, you know, put specifics on that other than to say we're trying to move in a pretty uh, expeditious way. Okay. Uh, I would like to uh, 
say to the Deputy Attorney General, we are very honored to have you here today. Uh, your remarks uh, uh, have gotten us off to a terrific start in terms of their substance and importance. And uh, we thank you and uh, we look forward at some time to having you with us again. So thank you very much. Well, <laughs> thanks for having me. And the chance to be here and, and uh, hope it proves to be, as I'm sure it will, a terrific program all day long. Well, thank you again very much. We, uh, we appreciate it.